Welcome back, guys. Our next section is section 15.2 from your textbook, uh, our second section for Unit 9, Evidence of Evolution. So this is coming after uh, History of Evolutionary Thoughts, which we covered in our last section. Uh, this is going to give us some evidence. So primarily, most of our evidence comes from the fossil record. At least right now, we're working towards more of a genetic uh, piece for um, for evidence, but for right now, a lot of it is fossil, uh, which this is the remains or traces of an organism that died long ago. No, that does not necessarily mean that it's, you know, the exact, uh, you know, uh, form that that particular animal was in or plant, because uh, remember, you can have fossils that are uh, footprints or eggs or excrements. So there's all kinds of stuff that can be fossilized. Uh, kind of an important thing to realize is that fossils are, most fossils are of extinct species, that makes sense, um, but 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever lived are extinct. That means right now only about one out of every 1,000 or so has survived to this point, uh, which means a lot of them historically have died off. Uh, but that should tell you about just the, you know, just the sheer number of different species that did exist, because... Just talking about insects alone, we have close to a million known species of insects. Well, if, you know, if you're doing some math here and you realize that uh, only one one-thousandth of species in the past survived until today, now you're talking about just insects alone cl having close to, you know, somewhere over a billion different species over time. Um, so this is some pretty powerful evidence of evolution. Um, you know, down here you've got uh, some fern leaves, you've got a trilobite, we've got some stuff... Um, a little looks like a spider encased in some amber there. So it's not fossilized in terms of rock, but it got fossilized in amber. So there's different types of fossils, uh, and we'll see how these things are useful here. Okay, so talking about fossils and superposition, this is going back to what we were talking about with the strata in the first section. Um, a guy named Nikolaus Steno uh, lived in the 1600s, introduced the idea of superposition. That is, if rock strata have not been disturbed, then the oldest stratum is on is the lowest one, and the newest stratum is the top stratum. So we can tell age, relative age, what's older than what, just simply by where it fell in the layers of rock, right? So, you know, if you're looking at the side of a cliff, okay, you can see different layers of rock. The stuff down here is the oldest. The stuff down at, up here would be the newest. So he's really the first one to explain that. Um, so in the 17 and 1800 scientists compare strata from the same geological period but different locations. Uh, so you know, they might have some being looked at here in the United States, some over in Europe, some in Asia, and they're comparing the different strata okay, from all across the world. Uh, they create what we call the geologic time scale, uh, which we'll see a picture of on the next slide. Um, they could determine a fossil's relative age, which it's not a, its exact age, just a relative age, okay, which is its age compared to other fossils by looking at its location in the strata. So if something, you know, was down here, we could say this, this fossil is older than one that's up here. Fossil, for example, fossil A is older than fossil B because it is in a lower strata. Okay, so here is the geologic time scale. No, you don't need to memorize this. Um, if you want, you can screenshot it, so that way you, you have access to it. Um, but the main ones here are thinking about our eras. Uh, we have Precambrian, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Uh, and you can see these things are all getting broken down here. This is in terms of millions of years, by the way, MYA, millions of years ago. Uh, so come down here to like Precambrian 4,500 million years ago. Well, this is 4.5 billion years ago is what that means. I know you can't necessarily, it doesn't say billion, but it, we're putting things in terms of million. So going back 4.5 billion years ago to 540 million years ago, and then life starts showing up after that point, and this is where the fossil records start coming in. Okay, and you guys can kind of check this out if you want. Uh, we might go into more detail on this later, but for right now, uh, just kind of know the, the main eras, Precambrian, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, um, and get a, a general idea of when they start. Precambrian about 4.5 billion years ago, uh, Paleozoic about 540 million years ago, 
Mesozoic, about $250 million, and Cenozoic, uh, the one we're currently in, is $65 million years ago. Okay, so here's just a picture of that idea of the geologic time scale. Uh, this is it, looking at the Grand Canyon. So just kind of seeing what was in here, the cool thing about it is with this river carving into the canyon, we got a bunch of exposed layers of rock. Uh, at the top, we had marine fossils, which if you know where the Grand Canyon is, uh, out in Arizona, right, there aren't any marine animals nearby. So that's kind of an interesting uh, fact. Right? We've got marine fossils at the top layer, vertebrate and animal tracks. Okay, so... Here we have things that clearly had feet. Here we had things that clearly lived in water. Interesting. Uh, plant and reptile fossils. Okay, more land animals. More marine fossils. Uh, trilobite fossils, which if you were looking on the previous slide, uh, now you're, you're talking about pretty early on in the geologic time scale. And then we have fossils of like colonial algae. Okay, and then nothing after that. No fossils down here as the river keeps carving into the rock. Uh, but this kind of tells you some interesting stuff that where this canyon is wasn't always just a canyon, that there was probably some o either oceans or lakes or something over them uh, at some point in time in the past. Okay, but what about it determining the exact age of something? Before, all we said is that we could determine relative age, right, which was that something was older or younger than something else. Um, if we are learning the exact age of something, it's called the absolute age. It's the true age of the rock or fossil. Now, back in the 1800s, they couldn't do this. Uh, but nowadays, we have a technique called radiocarbon dating, or just carbon dating is oftentimes what it's called. Uh, and they use car the isotope carbon-14. If you remember from first semester how we write isotopes, the 14, the number here, okay, this is the number of protons, plus the number of neutrons, okay, is what that is. Carbon's got six protons, which means in this case it must have eight neutrons, so that it has 14 total there in its nucleus. Anyways, we use carbon-14 dating, uh, and how much of that decays over time tells us just how old the fossil is. So with that, we're able to put together absolute and relative aging. Uh, scientists can try to piece together as much of the evolutionary picture as they can. Now, when we're comparing rock uh, strata from one part of the globe to another, not only do we know what order they came in, but we can match up the layers, okay? Because perhaps one uh, set of strata doesn't have the same top layer as other parts around the globe. So now we can match up by the absolute age and relative age. Um, now, even with all this, though, not all organisms left fossil evidence. So there are some gaps, right? There's a To create a fossil is actually in, incredibly difficult. It's not very likely that uh, when things die, they create fossils. They've got to be under pressure. Uh, they can't be disturbed. There's a lot of stuff that has to go right for fossils to be created. So not all organisms leave fossils. So there's going to be some gaps. There are going to be some gaps. As it says here, fossils rarely form. Conditions have to be just right. But even with that, right, Earth has had plenty of life, so even with the slim chance of a fossil forming, with so much life, there's going to be a lot of them. Okay, so what can we actually determine by looking at the fossil records? So here are the four things. Uh, we can determine organisms lived at different times. Different organisms lived at different times. Uh, we know that things, some things in the past did not coexist. Uh, trilobites, some of the earliest uh, animals, did not coexist with dinosaurs. They came well before that point. Today's organisms differ from those of the past. They don't look the same. The sizes are different. Uh, and the further back you go, the less alike we look. Uh, third, fossils found in adjacent layers are most like each other. So ones that exist in, in the same times look the most alike. That should make sense. The farther apart the strata are, the less similar fossils appear and number four, we can determine when and where organisms existed. Species may have been located in a specific place or spread out through the entire land mass. We get an idea of where they actually were. If we start finding fossils, uh, you know, in the Americas, we can also find them in Europe and Asia and Australia. Then we know that it was everywhere in the globe, not just in a particular location. Okay, so... Uh, by looking at this, and when we watched the video uh, in class before we had to break uh, from PBS, the NOVA documentary, uh, they mentioned something called transitional species. Species have a gradual sequence of forms over time, all right? Uh, 
uh, they transition from one species to the next, okay, as they become closer and closer to modern organisms. Okay, those species are called transitional species, and those are really what, what evolutionary biologists, biologists are looking for. Uh, they're looking for these transitional species because that's the evidence that they need. Species which have features that are in, intermediate between those of hypothesized ancestors and later descendants. So it helps us go from where we are currently and go back in time and figure out which things did we come from. So, for instance, marine mammals, right? We are mammals. Mammals are, well, they're, they're most famous for having hair. Uh, they give live birth. They evolve from land mammals. They had to have come from land mammals. Uh, so whales, okay, actually are descendants from land mammals. So somehow whales ended up going back into the water. Uh, well, if that's the case, right, and whatever came before whales lived on the land, and then it went back into the water to become a whale, uh, we should be able to go back and find evidence of species sharing characteristics in between this. That whatever this mammal was that went back into the water uh, forever, how many thousands or maybe perhaps even millions of years going from that land mammal back into being whales, we should be able to find some fossils that link those two. Uh, and we've found evidence for this. Those species are out there. Uh, but we haven't found all transitional species yet, so we don't have a perfect picture for every single organism, every different species. Uh, some organisms have missing pieces or gaps, and that's just how it's going to be until we find it. The good news is Earth has plenty of fossils. We just have to know where to look and when to look on the geologic time scale. Okay, so going back to that whale example just a minute ago, uh, we know that these species, uh, the whales, evolved from land mammals because they have these structures, which we'll see in a minute, are called vestigial structures, uh, which are basically leftover pieces from evolution, things that didn't quite fully get out of the evolutionary tree. Uh, so they've got these, like, what look like bones that are there for hind legs. So if we, that's kind of what's telling us that these modern whales are coming from some sort of land mammal. Uh, and so the species that we've found, uh, this one, this first one's called a Pachycetus, uh, right? This is 50 million years ago. Uh, we've got one here where the hind legs, notice instead of going straight down, start going back, and the front limbs do the same thing. They look like they're more on the side than they are facing forward. Uh, and so we've got a, a change in the shape there. And then 40 million years ago, so about 9 million years, that's a long time, <laughs> these arms completely start disappearing. So you have to excuse my dog. She's getting upset there in the background. Uh, that's Callie, everyone. Callie, hey. Uh, so anyways, this one here, this third one, 40 million years ago, the legs start to disappear. So somewhere in this 9 million year period, these arms were no longer necessary, and now modern whales look pretty similar to what these ones did 40 million years ago. All right, so what we've got right here uh, this is an example of evolutionary biologists looking for transitional species. Uh, and this has been a long project. This doesn't just happen overnight. We've got to find lots of examples of this. But, uh, and and they're, even though they aren't necessarily exact you know, proof, this is evidence to suggest transition from one species to another. In this case, uh, from fish to tetrapods, meaning a four legged creature, four-legged animal, uh, tetra for four there. Um, but anyways, what we've got is uh, a pieced together transitional species chart getting us to the point of living tetrapods. So uh, going all the way back here uh, to this ray-finned fish, uh, which then branched off into lungfish, and then which keeps branching off here, but Lungfish are, are remarkable because instead of breathing with gills, they breathe with, as you can probably guess by the name, their lungs, which is pretty important if you're trying to get out of the water. Uh, but we continue to keep going on this trend here. You can see how the fins keep migrating, some to the front, some more towards the back. They keep separating, and then some of them start facing forward, and eventually we arrive at this living tetrapod. So our, 
the job for evolutionary biologists has been to, to go out and find these species and see if we can't find examples of limbs that lead us from simple fins to uh, legs that also are arms or legs that have uh, digits attached to them as well. So this is not an easy thing to do. This also uh, requires quite a bit of long time in terms of history. Uh, this example here looks like it was over a 15 million year period uh, in the geologic time scale. So that, that's quite a while. Okay, and so part of uh, biology uh, looks at, evolutionary biology, looks at what's called biogeography, which is the study of the locations of organisms around the world. Um, even organisms that are closely related were adapted to environments in nearby regions. Uh, Darwin noticed this just on the islands, right? The Galapagos, how the finches uh, from island to island, the beaks were different. From tortoises from island to island, the shells were different. Uh, just a lot of that was based on the food that was on that particular island. So uh, even organisms that are closely related uh, adapt to their environments, very specific environments. Organisms could also evolve in an isolated environment. A uh, really classic example of this is Australia. Uh, Australia is, is a pretty isolated continent geographically. Uh, many species in Australia appear similar to those outside of the continent. They have wolves, cats, mice, moles, uh, right? However, most Australian mammals are unique because they are marsupials. They contain pouches for their young uh, that they are able to carry them around in. Uh, in this example of here, a Tasmanian wolf, or also called a Tasmanian tiger, does have a pouch to carry its, its young in. Um, and this is only in Australia. Uh, so the evidence here is that geographic isolation can sometimes give rise to very specific traits that weren't necessary elsewhere in the world. Uh, and this is all figured out by, of course, biogeography, looking at where things are located in the world. Okay, so part of the NOVA video that we watched in class uh, started looking at comparing structures in species. Uh, especially in what we refer to as anatomy and embryology. Embryos were super important in that video, if you remember. Uh, anatomy is simply the study of body structures in organisms, okay, where stuff is, what it's made out of, how it works. And embryology is the study of how an organism develops okay, prior to being born. Uh, and so this is, I think this one or something similar is currently in your textbook, uh, comparing the limbs of several animals, like a human arm, a penguin fin, an alligator arm, and a bat wing. Uh, and the way that these things are structured, if you guys, you guys might remember uh, from the video that they talked about, whoops, hox genes, uh, that these genes help give body placements. They tell where the arms are, how long they're going to be, uh, how long the digits are, how many digits there are. Those are all located uh, on hox genes. Um, and we call these structures homologous structures. Uh, these must have shared some kind of common ancestor, one that had limbs that looked like this, that seemed to have some kind of a bend, right, somewhere in the middle there, two bones in the forearm, one bone in the back part of it. Uh, they all pretty similar in terms of structure, so we call these homologous structures, anatomical structures that occur in different species but origina originated from a common ancestor. Uh, and then we have things that we call analogous structures. So they're not necessarily from the same... Uh, common ancestor, but they serve a similar function, meaning that evolutionarily speaking, it was advantageous to have this trait, and they these organisms developed it independently, that they didn't share a common ancestor. Uh, so, for instance, here, birds, bats, and moths all have wings, but birds and bats have uh, bones in their wings, moths don't, but they all develop this structure of wings because at some point there was an advantage to getting off the ground, to flying. Uh, so it does not mean that the birds, bats, and moths all had the exact same ancestor. Uh, it just means that they uh, have a similar function, analogous structure, something similar but not necessarily uh, exactly the same. These ones here, you can all see pretty clearly. They've got a bone here, right, your humerus bone. You've got two uh, frontal bones there for those two structures, the radius and the ulna. Okay, they're all very similar. Moths don't have that same setup. Birds don't have that same setup. This is indicating these came from a, the same mammal. Okay, and then embryology is super important uh, in terms of trying to figure out how uh, 
organisms are related. Um, and this was in that video, if you remember, there was a lot of talk about embryos um, and comparing the development of embryos. So here you've got a dogfish, a chicken, and a cat uh, and seeing how these things develop pretty early on. But uh, let's, let's get a couple of terms down. First of all, uh, let's talk about vestigial structures, structures that serve no function but resemble structures that serve a function in related organisms. Um, so they're left over from evolution, things that haven't fully gotten out of our genome, things that are still there but don't really serve much of a purpose. Uh, an example here, uh, human coccyx, uh, by the way, that is your tailbone, right, right at the top, uh, right at the bottom of your back, rather, uh, and that resembles a tail, uh, but we don't have a tail, right? Uh, some primates do. So at some point, that stopped being a useful trait, and we still have remnants of it. There's still a bone there, uh, but it's no longer useful. It's called a vestigial structure, something that we still have but not a whole lot of use for. Uh, whales, for instance, uh, have pelvic bones, uh, but... They don't really need pelvic bones. A human appendix is another example, something that probably at some point in the past was a useful organ to us uh, that we just have not evolved to have gotten rid of. It's still there. Uh, these are called vestigial structures. Uh, and you can usually find a lot of them when you start comparing embryos, right? That coccyx, the tailbone, you can start seeing tails forming even in humans uh, early on, and then it stops, whereas here, for, uh, for instance, like a cat, that will continue to grow. So embryology is the early development of embryos, um, similar embryos. As development proceeds, similarities end. Uh, so they start off pretty similar, and the longer it goes, uh, those species diverge in terms of their similarities. If you, again, if you remember, these are all based on those Hox genes uh, and switches, if you remember from that video, something that turns the genes off or on for longer amounts of time, shorter amounts of time, later on, earlier on. And all of that dictates the shape of this creature. Uh, it's kind of kind of cool. Um, but the similarity here of how all this stuff starts indicates that there's probably a common ancestor that developed this originally. Uh, it seemed to have been a pretty useful way uh, to develop, and so that species probably survived more, passed that development trait on, and here we are today. Okay, so what can we surmise from molecules? Okay, so this is getting into the, the genes, right? Uh, and this is the, what that P, uh, PBS video really covered, that NOVA video really covered, was the relationship between DNA and evolution. Uh, DNA and RNA are molecular bases for inheritance in all known species. Every single living thing uh, is using DNA and RNA to pass on its genes, right? Uh, it's first in DNA, and then it's transcribed into RNA. Some species, some not, not a whole lot, but some of them will use RNA as their basis for inheritance, uh, but almost all of them are DNA. Genetic code, which we talked about in the last unit, which you might remember, uh, is the same across all species encoded for in DNA, right? So that, that whole chart that had all 64 possibilities with the start codon and the, and the, the three stop codons, all of that is the same across every living thing, which is incredibly remarkable, and that seems to indicate that, once again, we had a common ancestor. Uh, biologists can compare DNA, RNA, proteins, and other molecules to see how closely related a species, uh, how closely related species are, uh, and that's what that video really covered, uh, showing you how we could how we could do that. Uh, the more similarities we have, the more closely related we are. So. Humans and chimps are estimated to be somewhere between 95 and 98.5% related. So we're pretty darn similar. It's that percent and a half difference that really makes us human. Uh, and if you watch the end of that PBS documentary, it, it really gets into what is that last percent and a half, uh, which is pretty neat. Okay, so kind of taking some of Darwin's thoughts and blending it with what we know today. Uh, blending natural selection with understandings of genetics. Uh, we know that genes play a role in evolution. Some genes get left behind, some get mutated and uh, provide some sort of beneficial adaptation. Um, we're constantly still looking at Darwin's theory, but it doesn't mean that we're done with it. It's not necessarily perfect. Uh, we're going to continue looking at it as uh, we get more information. Can't ever really prove it. Uh, and so a lot of people that you know want to try to like write off evolution as just being scientific theory and there's nothing there really uh, 
that's the problem is you can't really prove it. You would need millions of years. You would need generations and generations and generations uh, to really see that change. Um, so we have to turn to the fossil record. Okay, uh, It's widely accepted and applied by scientists. It's the best explanation uh, for the broad range of observations and helps make predictions. That's as, as good as we get there. Uh, I do like to include this little note. Uh, official church teaching. Uh, there was an encyclical in 1950 called Humanae Generis, uh, written by Pope Pius XII, uh, which kind of really touches on the evolution side of things, and it was uh, kind of skipped over for quite a while because uh, we just didn't want to deal with it as a church. But uh, the Pope at the time said, there is no conflict as long as we recognize the human soul is created by God and not the result of a purely material process. So, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's certainly nothing wrong with uh, hu with humans believing in evolution and the idea of evolution, so long as we realize that souls are being created by God. Okay, no issue. Uh, evolution is a planned process and a purpose-driven natural process, meaning that it's meant to arrive at the point that it's arriving at. Uh, it's, it's not completely random that there, there's possibly some sort of other force at work here. Huh? There you go. Okay, so phylogeny, another term for us. Uh, it's a relationship by ancestry among groups of organisms. Uh, what we produce are these, what are called phylogenetic trees. And that's a big, big word there, lots of syllables. Uh, and it's hypothesized phylogeny, how stuff is related. Uh, yes, it is hypothesized because guess what? We don't have the genetics of creatures that died millions of years ago, at least not most of them, unless they got encased in like amber or something. Uh, which is the whole plot of Jurassic Park. But anyways, uh, we don't have the genetic code for most of these things, so this is just hypothesized how these things must be related. Um, the trunk of this tree, right, the base of it, okay, uh, is the earliest common ancestor, uh, and then it will start branching out, okay? Those branches will branch out, right, how things are related, Okay. There's a lot of different ways that this stuff can go, but you'll see what these look like here pretty soon. A trunk is the earliest common ancestor, whatever that might have been. Uh, and the branch are the developing lineages of new species as things break off. So right, each one of these would have been like, for instance, a finch in the Galapagos Islands uh, for Darwin. Each node represents a new species breaking off. A node, by the way, okay, is the center point in the branch there. All right, my dog is barking again. Uh, but the node is where that branch breaks apart, right? So the V, right, and the fork in the road is the node, okay? Uh, the related groups appear closer together. So the things that break off over here, for instance, okay, this species is not as related to this one as, say, that guy is, all right? Uh, and where do we get this from? How do we piece this together? Well, from fossil evidence and DNA when available. Like I said, most of the time we don't have DNA available to us. Uh, so we look at the fossil record and try to piece this together. Again, it's, it's hypothesized. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just that uh, it's our best attempt to piece this thing together. Okay, so what does this look like? Uh, well, comparing whales, hippos, uh, buffaloes or ruminants, uh, pigs, peccaries, cam camels and llamas, uh, and when these things all separated. So this is millions of years ago, by the way. I know it doesn't say that on the time scale, but MYA, millions of years ago. Uh, they're all mammals. They all have hair. Uh, they all give live birth. So how are they related? Well, obviously the ones that are living in water probably uh, are more related to the ones not living in water. So we know that these two must be related to some common ancestor, uh, much further along in terms of history than back here. So our earliest common ancestor bit would have been whatever species X was way back here. Uh, and species X develops off into uh, the rest of this stuff and camels and llamas. So camels and llamas are the furthest removed from these guys down here. And the, the closer we get down to the whales, the closer these species are related genetically and hopefully through some fossil records. So what we're looking for as evolutionary biologist is, okay, let's go find examples of these uh, durantidids, uh, whatever those might be, and see if we can't find, okay, remember the nodes are where these species break apart, okay, and that also means that each one of those, right, their nodes, uh, are also, we should be looking for transitional species, okay, so somewhere in there, oops, we got to see, 
somewhere in there we should be able to find something that uh, shows that these diverged off, right? That they went their separate ways, that at some point something here, okay, decided I need to go back into the water, right? Uh, whereas hippos, right, seem like they're in water, but they can also survive outside of it, okay? They have legs still, whereas at this point, whatever th these ones were, decided legs were no longer useful, they developed back into fins. All right, so there you have it for that. Uh, there's some questions on the next slide uh, for us to look at, but I will probably intersperse them into the video when I go to produce it. So there you go.